So some of you might have seen this uh, story in Wired not that long ago, the three breakthroughs that have finally unleashed AI on the world. I'm, I'm here to sort of throw a little cold water and a little reality, I guess, onto that. So the three breakthroughs that Kevin Kelly talked about, the first two are undeniable, and, and you're all here for number two. Um, cheap parallel computation and big data. We wouldn't be talking about big data if we didn't have cheap parallel computation. The third is supposed to be advances in algorithms, and people are primarily talking about deep learning. I don't want to say we should throw away deep learning, but I think we need to have a realistic picture about what it's doing and what its limitations are. So Kelly said that we have this perfect storm of parallel computation, bigger data, and deeper algorithms that have generated the 60 years in the making overnight success of AI. I'm not sure we've actually had that success of AI yet. We're certainly finding some applications like recommendation engines, which are great, but there's a, lot, a long way to go. I, I always like to think of this quote from Peter Thiel. He says, we wanted flying cars, and instead we got 140 characters. Like We need to keep in perspective what it is that we've accomplished and where we'd really like to go. So when I was a kid, I saw Rosie the Robot. Now that I have kids, I want Rosie the Robot. I want someone that can, you know, some machine that can take care of the kids and the household uh, and so forth. What we really have is more like Roomba, which is like a hockey puck, pick, hockey puck that goes around and maybe picks up some of the dust some of the time. Um, this, this is the closest to Rosie the Robot that I know, if I can get the animation to work. Um, this is a, a real-world robot that is able to do kind of arbitrary tasks that you can set to do one task or the other. But it can't really do arbitrary tasks. And when you wait long enough, you'll start to see humans in the background, and you'll realize that this has actually been sped up by like a factor of 60. So, um, you know, Rosie the Robot is not really here. We don't really have the AI um, that we need uh, just yet to do arbitrary tasks. Um, Kurzweil is always talking about exponential progress in AI, and it might feel that way lately with, for example, the progress in Go. Um, there are narrow domains where we can build AI pretty well. The problem is really in broad problems and open-ended problems. What I would like to show you now is data for strong AI, for artificial intelligence that could solve open-ended problems. Um, unfortunately, they don't exist, so as a licensed college professor, I made them up. Um, and what I have here is Eliza in 1965 and Siri in roughly now, um, on my hypothetical measure of strong AI. Well, Eliza was able to fool people into thinking it was a real therapist back in 1965. Chatbots are not new. We have better chatbots now, but they're still not able to sort of understand arbitrary conversations without very quickly saying ridiculous things. So why don't we have strong AI or artificial general intelligence yet when we finally do have the big data and we finally have the parallel compute, cheap parallel compute? What explains the gap between the hype about AI where you know, people think that we're going to lose our jobs next week and the reality of what AI can do, which is actually pretty limited? Um, the answer, I think, is that almost all the hype is about deep learning, which is a great technique, but it's only part of what we need for AI, and we need to put it in perspective. What it really is, deep learning, is just a fancy way of doing automatic pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is part of cognition of how we think, and it's part of what artificial intelligence needs to do. You need to see things. You need to be able to understand what you're seeing. You might think of deep learning as something like the early layers of visual cortex. It's what part of the brain does. But there's lots of other systems like the prefrontal cortex that are doing decision making and language and so forth that we haven't yet understood the principles of. So most of deep learning takes its cue from an idea from the late 1950s um, that Hubel and Wiesel won the Nobel Prize for. And the idea is simply that you have simple cells that feed into more complex cells that feed into still more complicated cells. And from that, you get a kind of abstraction. So you might recognize letters after first recognizing strokes of letters. And it's been around for a long time. There's good evidence for it back to the 50s. There's evidence now, for example, that the brain has abstract cells that, represent, um, that recognize things like Oprah Winfrey. So there's an Oprah Winfrey detector cell in at least some people's brains. Um, and this is consistent with this idea of a hierarchy of feature detectors, is the technical term for it. And this is exactly what drives deep learning, this is how these systems work. But that doesn't mean that it's a full solution to all the things we need to do in cognition. So there are actually a bunch of problems with deep learning that you should be aware of. One is the reliability is not that great. So in any given domain, it's easy to come out with a paper where you show some really impressive examples. But if you read carefully, there's almost always some very bizarre um, cases. So this one was in the New York Times. There's a captioning thing that came out of Google. Um, you see a person, so you, you feed in a picture and you get text back. It seems super impressive. It seems like you must have strong AI here if I can feed in the top left picture and get back that a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road is, is a proper description. The problem is if, if you dig into the um, appendices, you, you see that they, 
there are a lot of problems. Um, this one makes me think of Oliver Sacks, man who mistook his wife for a hat, because the, the computer system here has mistaken a parking sign with stickers on it for a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. Now, people in the deep learning field will say, well, that's just like an optical illusion. People are subject to optical illusions. But it's really more like a hallucination. I mean, if you went around telling me that this is what you saw, I wouldn't say maybe you need to change your prescription. I think there's a more serious problem. Um, <coughs> what's going on in deep learning is that most of the tests are cases that are what I would call closed task rather than an open-ended task. So ImageNet is the famous thing that's going around now. There's a thousand categories, and you can carve up your space of examples in that thousand categories and look like you're actually perceiving objects, not just recognizing things like textures. But when you go out to the larger open-ended world and anything could be the answer, the systems don't do as well. Um, this is a paper by some people who are now working for me at Geometric Intelligence. Um, what they found is you could easily find textures that totally fool deep learning. So yellow and black school stripe, and yellow and black stripes looks to deep learning like a school bus. Um, this pattern of wavy lines looks like a starfish. So if, if there's an automated drone trying to attack you, you can wear this t-shirt and the automated drone will be easily fooled. Um, this is true even for like papers that came out last week, um, which this one did. In almost anything that you look at, there are, you don't need to read the details, but there are always like a whole lot of cases where the systems work really well and a whole lot of very bizarre answers. Um, and this is a problem in the real world. So NVIDIA showed this very seemingly powerful demo where they trained a deep net for 72 hours on roads in New Jersey, and they showed a video where it seems to be able to follow lanes in the rain and things like, like that. But when you look at the fine print, their measure is something called autonomy, and it's calculated per minute. So what it really boils down to is that there were only two crashes um, or two necessities for human drivers to take over the wheel in your average daily commute. Well, that's just not good enough. I mean, it's a nice proof of concept, but if you have a driverless car system um, and you scale it to 100,000 of them and it's having that uh, much trouble, it's, it's a real problem. So what unites these issues is it's a poor performance in what I would call the long tail. So systems like deep learning are really good when you have a lot of data, and you'll always have some examples for which you have a lot of data, and they're really not so good when you get out to rare cases. So the accidents we've seen with Tesla, there are two of them now, two fatalities, um, or at least it appears to be two fatalities, were both sort of unusual cases where there's less data. The second problem um, is that Engineering with deep learning is really hard. And Peter Norvig has made this case very clearly recently. So it's hard to debug a deep learning system. It's hard to re revise it incrementally, and it's hard to verify it. And so it's a good tool to have in your toolkit, but it doesn't mean it's the whole deal. People talk about end-to-end -end deep learning. I would be careful about that. The third problem is there's no real traction in language understanding and causal reasoning. I first pointed this out four years ago in The New Yorker um, when deep learning started becoming popular. And I, what I said was, realistically, deep learning is only part of a larger challenge of building intelligent machines. Such techniques lack ways of representing causal relationships. They're likely to face challenges in acquiring abstract ideas. They have no obvious ways of performing logical inferences, and they're still a long way from integrating abstract knowledge. I think all of that is still true, despite way more hype for deep learning four years later. And I paraphrased an old parable. I said, deep learning is a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. We're seeing better and better ladders. I'm still not seeing the moon. Um, so here would be an easy question, easy-ish for a deep learning system, is what, what is this man carrying? It, at least could it say that there's a horse in the picture? A harder question would be like, what's unusual about this picture? Like the fact that the horse is upside down or that a person is actually carrying a horse is pretty unusual. We don't have systems that are able to make those kinds of inferences. So Allen AI Institute has a test to see what system can first pass eighth grade science. The answer is none of them can so far. When you get to things where you have to reason at the level of an eighth grade or read texts about science, we just don't know how AI can do that yet. The core problem, I think, is people are looking for too simple a solution. In physics, the people are looking for sort of four equations on a t-shirt, a grand unified theory. And I don't think we're going to get that in neuroscience. So I think um, evolution leads to chance and all kinds of complexities. People are trying to reverse engineer their brain, but they're oversimplifying it. They would like to have a kind of simple heliocentric centric universe or something like that with not too many equations. But the reality is that neuroscience is really complicated. There are a lot of different systems in the brain. On the left um, of that figure, I have an old underestimate of the complexity just in the visual areas of a monkey brain. Um, and the right is showing it's much more complicated than we thought. Um, the sheer number of types of neurons in the brain is about 1,000. The number of types of neurons in your average neural network is one. 
There's something that's being missed between, there's some gap between what we're doing in machine learning and what the brain is actually doing. And you could say this at the level of individual synapses too, where there's a lot going on, a lot of individual proteins. So the way I think about it is microprocessors have instruction sets. There are things like additions, comparisons, um, copying things, di different kinds of operations. And every program is translated into this set of instructions. Of course, they differ from different microprocessors. But none of, nobody builds an instruction set of one. And essentially what we have in deep learning is an instruction set of one right now. I think we need to look broader. So um, I think we need a, what I would call a field of cognitive neuroontology where we try to have an inventory of computations. What's happening in deep learning I think is too narrow. I have tried in, uh, um, since 2001 to be proposing a broader set, and I refer you to my 2004 article in Science, The Atoms of Neural Computation, where we go through a bunch of candidates. There's an article in BioArchive you might look at. Um, since I'm running short on time, I'll mention um, that my company is trying to do something like this, trying to broaden the set of computations while trying to get better reliability out of deep learning-like systems. So we're building hybrids between deep learning and some new techniques that we're working on. And what we're getting is better, more stable, results with less data. So this is a standard benchmark, and the blue is the deep learning, the red is us. We're getting better accuracy, say e equivalent accuracy with half as much data, and the error bars are showing that we're getting it more reliably um, than deep learning. I think we still have a ways to go, but I think this is where the field as a whole needs to go, is so you don't just do well in the left-hand side of, of that curve, but you also do well in the right-hand side of um, the curve with the rare examples. Here's just one, one more case, and then I'll wrap up. Um, on the right, we have um, DeepMind's state-of-the-art learning for video games. And on the left, we have what we're doing. DeepMind stuff memorizes what you need to do in a particular world. But now we change that world so that the, the posts are closer together and it starts crashing a lot. You, there's a lot of sort of appearance that deep learning has learned something deeper here, deep reinforcement learning, when really what's going on is mostly memorization. Um, and when you change the environment, things don't work well. Again, when you're thinking about your driverless cars or drones or things like that, you need something that's adaptive. We need better systems. My company's making at least some progress towards that. Um, here we're showing that we're doing better in the rain. So to conclude, I think big data really is an important step towards AI. I mean, Kevin Kennedy is absolutely right about that. And deep learning is an important step towards AI, but it's not AI itself. Um, I think it's often mistaken for that. People talk about end-to-end -end deep learning. But by themselves, big data and deep learning aren't really enough for the sort of flexible, adaptive learning and reasoning that are characteristics of human beings. Kids learn with small data, right? You don't have to have big data to solve every problem. Even if you do have big data, you want to be able to do causal reasoning and things like that. We don't yet have the right AI systems to do that. I think one important step to getting there is to enrich the instruction set of what we're building our machine learning algorithms out of. And I thank you very much.